This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. The economy is doing very well. Most people who want to find jobs are finding them, and unemployment and inflation are low. And with that, the Fed raises interest rates and policymakers signal more to come. What this means for the economy, the stock market, and your money. Employee perks, health care costs are rising, but passing those costs on to workers is the last thing companies want to do. Carving up California, a billionaire venture capitalist dream just took another step forward. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Wednesday, June the 13th. And we bid you good evening, everyone, and welcome. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates for the second time this year, and it's aiming for another two hikes before the year is out. That's a somewhat more aggressive stance than it had previously signaled. It points to the central bank's confidence in the economy. The Fed chairman describing the economy as being robust, while also acknowledging that inflation is inching higher. Steve Leisman is covering the story for us tonight from Washington. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates by a quarter point to a new range of 1.75 to 2 percent and signaled further rate hikes ahead amid what Fed Chairman Jerome Powell described as a robust U.S. economy. I would say that the economy is in great shape. Um, if you look at household surveys, confidence is high. Look at businesses, uh, confidence is high. Um, if you ask, uh, if you survey uh, workers about the job market, they'll say that it's a really good environment to find jobs. If you survey businesses, they'll say that uh, workers are scarce. So I think overall we have, we have a really uh, solid economy on our hands here. And so what we're doing is we are trying to conduct monetary policy in a way that will sustain that expansion, keep the labor market strong, and keep inflation above, right at, sorry, not above, but right at 2%. The Fed believes the economy is strong enough now to withstand an additional rate hike as soon as this year. The consensus of forecasts among officials is now for an additional two hikes after this one. It was previously only one hike. There were other changes announced by Powell as he moves increasingly to put his personal stamp on the Fed he took over in February. As chairman, I hope to foster a public conversation about what the Fed is doing to support a strong and resilient economy. And one practical step in doing so is to have a press conference like this after every one of our scheduled FOMC meetings. And we're going to do that beginning in January. That will give us more opportunities to explain our actions and to answer your questions. Powell said the Fed is taking a wait and see approach on how much fiscal policy boosts the economy. He said it would provide significant support for demand over the next three years, but was uncertain if it would change supply of labor or investment. That could boost productivity and the economy over the long term. He did say business leaders have indicated to Fed officials concern about trade policy, and some have suggested it could be holding back investments. Powell is showing himself to be a chairman willing to answer all questions, but to do so in fewer words than his predecessors. And one side of that, the Fed's policy statement, now down to just a single page for the first time in quite a while. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman in Washington. By the way, the latest report on wholesale prices supports the idea that inflation is firming the producer price index out this morning, which measures the prices businesses receive for their goods and services, rose by 0.5 percent in May from a month earlier, in part because of higher energy costs. That was more than expected, by the way. On an annual basis, the index was up 3.1 percent. That's the biggest increase we've seen in more than six years. This report follows the strong consumer inflation data that we told you about yesterday. So let's talk more now about the Fed's policy decision and what it means for your investment strategy. We are joined by Albion Financial's chief economist and chief investment officer, Jason Ware, to talk about rising rates and inflation. Welcome, Jason. Nice to have you here. Thank you. I yeah, think, thanks for having me. I think almost everybody expected the move today by the Fed, the June increase. But what's your opinion about the fact that the market should now be prepared for a total of four rate hikes? So I think despite the uh, consensus discussion today about this being a bit of a surprise to market markets, the market has done a pretty good job over the last few months of trying to price in for rate hikes. In fact, if you look at some of the volatility that we've had this year in the equity market, one could, uh, I think, make a pretty strong argument that part of the volatility has been a function of just that, the market grappling with this notion of, 
is the Powell Fed going to do three hikes this year or four? I think the market going into this meeting had priced a pretty equal probability of four versus three. And getting more clarity now with the dot plot on having four between now and the end of the year, the markets took it in stride, I would argue, today. Where, where do you stand on inflation right now? I mean, clearly these latest reports we've been getting on wholesale prices and on retail prices show that inflation is creeping ever higher. Are we going to be paying much more down the road? And do you think the Fed's behind the curve on that? So, no, I think the, uh, the Fed has a pretty good uh, big gauge on where, Fed, uh, where inflation is right now. If you look at core inflation, PCE, which is the Fed's preferred measure, it's running just under 2%. CPI is around 2% core. The, t to your point about producer price inflation, that's been running ahead of consumer prices for some time now, for a couple of years. And we haven't seen that feed into consumer prices in a way that one might expect. There are a couple of reasons for that. But... The way we look at PPI is today's number was, was like you said, it bested consensus and was hot on a headline basis, meaning energy had a part of a, a, had a pretty good component to that, uh, that beat. But if we look at core PPI, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not suggesting any kind of material inflation. I think the Fed has a pretty good handle on where things are. And really, the, the components that make up inflation, that is rising wages and looking at the, the uh, global output gap, that is where uh, global output is versus where it could be, where potential output, things are looking pretty imbalanced right now. So our view of inflation is Two to slightly low 2% is probably fair for now. One of the things uh, that the chairman mentioned uh, and, and also that Steve mentioned in his report is the uncertainty surrounding trade and possible tariffs and what the impact might be on our economic growth and our economic progression. How does the Fed factor that in? Because there's so much rhetoric from coming out of Washington, it's hard to know exactly where we sit. Right. Yeah, it is. And uh, Mr. Powell mentioned that today, quote unquote, they want to stay in their lane on some of these mm -hmm. issues. I, I don't think anyone really knows how the potential for a trade war could impact uh, the, the key metric the Fed is now paying attention to, that is inflation. Um, we know that if we were to see an escalating trade war, the idea that rising consumer prices from that, I think, is something that we could expect and financial markets would probably begin to price into inflation expectations. Right now, long-run inflation expectations remain unchanged at the Fed as far as they're concerned, and that informs their decisions on how they want to impact monetary, monetary policy over the short run. So I don't think they're taking a, a big... Um, stance on what they think trade could do, but it's something that market participants and economists are watching very closely. Indeed. Jason, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Jason Ware with Albion Financial. And a little bit later in the program, we'll talk to Sharon Epperson about how those rising rates will impact your budget. Meanwhile, late today, a big story. Comcast made a $65 billion all-cash offer for some of the assets of 21st Century Fox. That bid is nearly 20 percent higher than an all-stock proposal for the same uh, Fox assets that Disney made last December. question now is, will Disney try to top Comcast's offer? And this brewing battle occurs just as traditional media companies are trying to better compete with the likes of a Netflix. As we told you, Comcast was expected to make this offer if AT&T's proposal to take over Time Warner was approved. And as we reported, a federal judge cleared the way for that deal yesterday. On Wall Street, as you might imagine, media and telecom stocks rose on the potential for more merger activity in that sector. But that wasn't enough to lift the broader market, which came under pressure after the Federal Reserve raised interest rates. So when all was said and done, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 119 points to 25,201. The Nasdaq, which hit a new intraday high, was down eight and the S&P 500 dropped 11. And oil prices turned higher today as supplies fell more than expected. A government report pointed to a bigger than expected decline in domestic crude supplies. It was, in fact, the largest one-week decline since March. But oil price gains were capped after a separate report from the Energy Information Administration showed an increase in crude production. So we had conflicting reports there today, but domestic crude rose to a two-week high, settling at more than $66 a barrel. 
The White House is trying to block Congress from derailing its deal with China's ZTE. The agreement allows China's second largest telecom company to resume doing business with American suppliers. But it is evident that the company is still reeling from the temporary ban on the supply of crucial parts. Yunus Yun is in Beijing. ZTE shares fell 40 percent today in Hong Kong, wiping $3 billion off the company's market cap. Investors punished the stock, worried about the hefty penalties the Chinese telecoms company will have to pay as part of its deal to get the U.S. government to lift a ban that blocked it from buying American components. ZTE was being penalized for violating U.S. law, but the Trump administration worked out a deal to keep the company in business. One analyst told me the fines are huge for ZTE. The current and previous fines add up to $2.3 billion, the equivalent of three years of profits. Investors are also worried about how or if the company will survive. Senior management needs to be overhauled within 30 days, and the deal might fall apart altogether because Congress is trying to block the arrangement. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross is attempting to sell the deal to skeptical lawmakers, but fund managers here are not feeling optimistic about ZTE's prospects, especially with China's trade relationship with the U.S. so strained. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yoon in Beijing. Time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. We begin with AT&T. Their rating was cut to sell from neutral by Moffat Nathanson. A day after that deal to acquire Time Warner was approved, the analyst cites AT&T's debt load post-merger. Price target now $28. The stock dropped 6% today to $32.22. Square shares were downgraded to neutral from buy at Buckingham Research. The analyst cited the stock's valuation after an 80% gain since the beginning of the year. Price target $65. That stock fell 1% to 62 and a half. Hershey's shares were downgraded to underperform from neutral at Credit Suisse. The analyst says the shift to online purchasing by shoppers reduced the numbers of impulse buys of Hershey's products. The price target is $80. Shares of Hershey fell 2 percent to 91.22. Netflix price target was raised to $490 by Goldman Sachs, making it the highest price target on the street. The analyst says Netflix content offerings will result in better than ex expected subscriber growth. The firm maintains its buy rating and the stock gained 4 percent to 379.93. Still ahead, why the tight labor market may be putting a cap on your health care costs. Germany has fined Volkswagen more than a billion dollars over that diesel emission rigging scandal. The, uh, it is one of the biggest fines, by the way, ever imposed on a company in Germany. Volkswagen will not appeal the fine and says that it hopes this penalty will help the automaker move past the scandal. Large employers for years managed rising health care costs by shifting the burden to their workers. But employers now say that is no longer an option. They're rethinking employee benefits, and you can thank the tight labor market. Bertha Coombs has the details. Atlantic Health System is looking to lower its health costs next year by joining with other New Jersey hospitals on a new plan for their combined 50,000 workers. How do you drive out unnecessary utilization while uh, maintaining very high quality. We've got a lot of experiences with that. So what we're trying to do here is take those best practices and apply them to our own workforce. They hope to put the savings toward wages. You know, the opportunity for savings here allows us to really put more in our employees' pockets and continue to be a very effective employer in that regard. The tight labor market is making a lot of large employers rethink their health plans for next year, according to researchers at PwC. We asked, you know, what are you doing in terms of strategy for the future? And last year, a lot of them were going to go full replacement high deductible plan. This year, they really backed off. 
Large employers expect health care costs to increase another 6% in 2019. Many plan to focus on tighter medical networks and drug plans to hold down expenses, but most aren't planning to raise deductibles or cost sharing. We really think that's because they're worried about the labor market being so tight, so they're kind of staying exactly where they are. They're not shifting costs to employees, they're kind of absorbing it. Like the health venture between Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan, Atlantic and its partners in New Jersey are hoping to leverage data and digital tools to help make using health insurance easier for their workers. This gives us an opportunity to really prove to ourselves and then prove to the local employer markets that we can kind of develop something that's different. Well, Amazon Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan are still getting off the ground. The hospital group expects to finalize their new plan this June so they can roll it out for 2019 open enrollment in the fall. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bertha Coombs in Morristown, New Jersey. So what impact will this have on small companies, your health care coverage, the health care industry? Joining us tonight to talk about it, Craig Garthwaite is a professor at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good to see you too. Thank I you. I want to sort of cut to the chase here. You know, as Sue mentioned earlier, companies for years have been shifting the burden, the financial burden to its employees. But with this tight labor market, does that mean that, that burden is going to go back to the companies? Are we going to be paying a little bit less or more steady premiums because of the tight labor market? Uh, I think so. I think it's good to take a step back and think about what health insurance from your employer actually is. And it's really just a form of non-cash compensation. And so when the labor market isn't particularly tight, they can shift some of that onto employees. But when they're competing for workers, they got to think about this as they think about the cash salary that they give you. And so they're not as able to sort of force the employee to pay more. They've got to bear more of the cost for themselves. And how do they do that? I mean, what is the bottom line impact? Because health care costs, is a, it, it's a significant bottom line item for a lot of companies, and especially small companies. How do they account for that? How much does the public market work into that? So, I mean, you want to think about this in the same way that they think about giving a raise to an employee in a tight labor market. We're really, what we're discussing here is the nature of the compensation that we're going to give to employees when the labor market's tight in order to attract them. And so I can give you some cash. I can also give you a more generous health insurance package. You'll find some mixture of that to be attractive, and you'll come work for me as opposed to one of my competitors. That's all we're looking at here. The, the real difficulty they face in some ways is when health insurance costs are going up really fast, um, and they've got to figure out sort of how do, I, how do I lower the value of that package as opposed to cutting your pay, because people really don't like to have their pay cut. But will those health insurance costs continue to rise that much if it becomes a more competitive market? If, I can, if I'm an employer and I need to pay my employees better health care coverage provided, I may go somewhere else if I can get a better deal. Yeah, I think employers are always looking for what's the best sort of cost benefit calculation they can get from their health insurance. So if I think that my employees are willing to take a less valuable package in terms of choice so I can restrict the number of hospitals they go to, I'm going to do that. And then depending upon the nature of the labor market, I'm going to either have to give them some money in cash or I'm just going to let them go to one of my competitors. But it's, it's, this is all about a competition for employees. I think the biggest misconception that we have uh, when we think about health insurance from our employer is that they're giving us health insurance. Your employer doesn't give you anything. Your employer pays you compensation in return for the value that you generate for them. And now we're just going to have a conversation about how much of that's going to come in cash and how much is going to come in health insurance benefits. So who is this going to squeeze the most? Obviously, the employee is going to benefit from it um, to a certain extent. But is it, is it the mid-sized company? Is it the small company? Who do you think is going to get pinched? Um, I think it's going to be the person who has the least ability to negotiate a better health insurance premium. And that's probably going to be smaller health insurance company or smaller, smaller firms. And it's going to be sort of startups and entrepreneurs and things like that. You know, one, one thing we've learned from the past four years is that Americans really like their employer provided health insurance. It's actually a quite popular program. And that's why we haven't seen people go to the Obamacare marketplaces. But the result of that is that large employers have a really big benefit because they get the best deal on health insurance and they can offer that to employees at the best part at the best price. Craig Garthwaite with Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Thank you. And to read more about health care benefits and the tight labor market, you can head to our website at NBR.com. 
Caterpillar is raising its dividend, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The construction equipment maker said it would hike its dividend by 10 percent to 86 cents a share. With that increase, the yield on the stock is more than 2 percent. But investors didn't cheer the news. They sent the shares down nearly 2 percent to 154.71. Earlier this week, we told you that the medical device maker Boston Scientific was approached by its rival, Stryker, about a potential merger. Well, today, Stryker said it was, in fact, not engaged in any talks with Boston Scientific regarding a deal. Stryker shares rose 2.5 percent to 166.60. Meanwhile, shares of Boston Scientific fell 6 percent to 31.73. Elsewhere, Madrigal Pharmaceuticals is reportedly considering selling itself after it received takeover interest from drug makers that are looking at its eye treatments. Bloomberg reports that Madrigal is working with an investment banker on a potential sa sale, and shares of the company climbed 10 percent today on that news to finish the day at 313.24. Then after the bell, Tailored Brands reported higher sales and profits, but the stock still fell the owner of Joseph A. Bank and Men's Warehouse also said that new customers have begun to shop at its locations. That helped the same store sales edge higher. But Taylor Brands maintained its outlook for the full year, and it seems like investors wanted more. Shares were down uh, sharply in initial after hours trading on that news. They finished the regular session down about 3 percent at 33.45. Will California, the world's fifth largest economy, be split into three? That is the question a lot of people are asking, and it's a question that they'll have to answer come November, now that that plan has earned a spot on the ballot. The man behind the campaign is a venture capitalist who says dividing the state would lead to better infrastructure and better education. Robert Kavasik asked Californians if they're ready to split up the state. This is going to be on the ballot in November. Oh, wow, that's stupid. Splitting the state three ways. Some wonder why. If it's not broken, why fix it? But is California just too big? That is a very hard question to answer, given the resources that we have. Voters will answer the question in November. Should there be a Northern California with San Francisco and Sacramento, a Southern California stretching from Fresno to San Diego, and the state of California from Monterey to L.A.? I don't really like the idea. I kind of like it. This is the California 3 Facebook page, and this is the man behind the movement, Tim Draper, a Silicon Valley venture capitalist. And some are getting behind his idea. Yes, I live in the Central Valley. Martin is from Bakersfield. We got to have a voice somewhere. People in a rural area have the same voice per capita as you do in an urban area. You realize it would be really to the great detriment of the people of this state. Plenty of time till Election Day to navigate this new map. I see how that can make sense, but I, I personally don't like that at all. And also, 53 states just doesn't sound as good as 50. <laughs> uh, even if the voters do say yes in November, Congress would need to approve it. And in case you're wondering, the last time a state was divided was in 1863 when West Virginia split from Virginia. Coming up, why your budget will likely feel the impact of the Fed's interest rate hike. As mortgage rates moved higher last week, the number of Americans applying for new mortgages fell. The Mortgage Bankers Association reports a 1.5 percent decline from the previous week. Applications are down 15 percent from a year ago, and mortgage refinancing demand was also lower. So we began our program tonight by telling you about the Federal Reserve's decision to raise interest rates today. And we finish up tonight with a look at what higher rates could mean for your budget. And to do that, we are joined by our personal finance correspondent, Sharon Epperson. So where do we see the first line impact on our budget here? Well, when you look at what you're paying and the interest that you're paying on various products, let's start with credit cards. You're going to see a significant impact, almost the same amount of impact that we're seeing in terms of the rise that we've seen in the Fed funds rate. Look at what's happened to credit cards. Look at what's happened to auto loans. Auto loans, not as great an increase because we aren't seeing that as tied to the short-term Fed funds rate. And then, of course, the bill that you really need to pay yourself every month to yourself for savings. Well, that's not really budged at all. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> right. It's all, why does it always work uh, that way? It does work that way. What, what should people do right now 
um, because if we're, the Fed may have two more interest rate hikes exactly. in its pocket. So what should they do now? Well, we're looking at the average credit card rate right now already near 17 percent at a record, and it's going to continue to go mm -hmm. up. So you need to know what your credit card rate is. Many borrowers have no idea, and it's important to know that rate just so that you know how you're going to budget to pay down that rate as well. You also want to shop around and see if you could get a lower rate, whether it's on your credit card or maybe some other adjustable rate that you have on an adjustable rate mortgage or home equity line of credit. See if you can lock in a lower rate and focus on that variable rate debt because that is the debt that's going to continue to rise. You always want to try to get a fixed rate loan if you can, but if you're talking about variable rate, that's what you need to pay down first. Now, we laughed about the savings rate number. Right. It's not going up all that much. Right. But seriously, what can savers do to try and maximize their returns here? Yeah, well, once you've paid down this debt and you're starting to pay down your debt, you want to put that money towards savings because you still need that emergency fund and you can't get more money on it. You need to shop around. The average bank savings rate hasn't increased that much, but online banks offer a much higher rate and you may get a rate there of close to 2%. Short-term CDs, just one year, you're just tying up your, your money in a certificate of deposit for that long, could be 2.5%. So that will give you a better deal too. But again, sometimes these are teaser offers. They don't always last that long. You want to make sure that whatever rate you're getting on that savings is really going to last you for as long as you need to. Sharon Epperson, as always, sure. thank you. My pleasure. See you later. Before we go, here's another look at the day on Wall Street. The Dow fell 119 points, the Nasdaq was down 8, and the S&P 500 dropped 11. And that is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.